dovetail on that, uh, that, you know, you know, when we, when, when we're seeing these things happening and there's the, a lot of prophetic, uh, vision like there was last night, sometimes the, 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 I know this happens with me and I, I, I imagine that it happens with you as well, um, stuff happens so quickly and we're trying to absorb it and we're, our spirits are receiving it probably way beyond our own understanding and what so the, the place where I'm at in my life is when I'm hearing a word and it's from the Lord it's very easy to go wow that's really cool that's a really cool word and I know that God's in this but but it's really important to go back and just say okay Lord what what is it that you're trying to say let's and, and what is it that we're supposed to do as a result of that word and um uh, so what, what happened in very quick sequence last night was this whole issue of the cloud and this cloud being here and then the, um, the Exodus, uh, Susan was talking about Exodus 19 and I, I think you read it, but I wanted to go over it again this morning so that we, so that we, we get it. Um, and it's Exodus 19 verses 16 and 17. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. That's where we are right now. We're at the foot of the mountain. The mountain was in, in this thick cloud. We, we saw the picture that happened right before the, me the meeting started. And, um, and, and you heard uh, Gina and Wendy and the people, local people, say they've never seen a weather pattern quite like this where, the, where this, there's been this cloud over the mountain, but everything else was totally clear. So it, 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 it was... Part of it was, yes, there was a cloud on the mountain, but the other part was this, hasn't, this is not the usual weather pattern for, for this area, for Fremont. So, and it happened right before the meeting, and then Peter gets up and, 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 and gives his verse. But the, um, another part of the significance of this verse and, and this thing that's happening is that when we had our first meeting concerning the wa watch, which was last July in Bakersfield, Right at after the end of the meeting, this is in July when there's no when it's like sunny, there's no rain, there's no there's no precipitation, there's no anything. Two hours after the meeting ended, we had thunder and lightning and rain. I mean, it started two hours after the meeting. I've never seen anything like this in Bakersfield. There was and there were outpourings of rain in different parts of the state. San Diego had I think two inches. Uh, there was even, you know, rain in the Mojave Desert. There was, there was rain in Bakersfield as well in a season when there's not rain. So, so this was like extremely unusual, and it happened two hours after the end of that meeting. So listen to this verse again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the middle of the totally dry season in California. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings. And we had that right after this meeting in July. And a thick cloud on the mountain. Well, we just had that last night. So this is, this is I, I, I believe that this is God. He's trying to say yes and amen. And he's trying to say, I am deadly serious about what I'm, what I'm doing. I am paying attention to this meeting. It wasn't, this wasn't a good idea from Fred and Sue, this is, I have called you here. I've called you here. And, 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 and we all know that. I mean, we wouldn't have been at this meeting. I know you didn't come because of us. You came because you're hearing from God. But he wants, to, he, wants to, he wants us to know at a different level. He wants us to understand at a different level that he did call us here. He did call us here. And our task in this meeting, part of our task in this meeting is to is to say this, what, Lord, what are you calling us to corporately, and then what's our individual part? And I'm just telling you that it's, this is so important because part of what the enemy does is he kind of go, you, is we kind of have this thing, 
and I, I just I, I know I have this, so I'm sure that many of you do as well. This thing where uh, we we know that it's God, we get excited about it, we know that He's called a meeting, but then we go, well, I'm I I just kind of want to be a part of this. Um, I'm not sure exactly what my part is, but I just I know that I want to be a part of it. Well, that's good, but God wants us to go into a deeper place. Is that He He is not only serious about the corporate call, but he's serious about our individual call. And there's a place where the enemy can come in and start uh, disqualifying or minimizing our own individual part. And I just want to speak to that right now and say that that's coming down today. It's coming down right now. That that's not God, that God is speaking to us individually, that we each have a very vital, important part. And it's a part individually but it's a part individually as part of a team, as part of a, 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 a corporate team, because the part of the significance of the watch and what God's calling us to do right now is that we have to operate as a team, as a community of believers, because the power of agreement is so strong when we come together, and, and we know this as we've come together on these watch calls from you know different our different places, and we come together the power of agreement is so strong that that's where God says, you know, two of you agree in anything. I'll do it. Two. So the, the, I want to reemphasize what Sue said in her talk last night because, again, there's a lot of information. A lot of stuff happened last night. But part, you remember part, the, the, the three things that she was saying about the distinctives of the watch is it's um, community, it's communication, and it's commitment. So God's trying to speak to us about all three of those things this morning. And the commitment part is I think he's trying to emphasize that there is a, a higher level of commitment that he's calling us to. We all sense that. But I just want to speak to the, the, the potential for the disqualifying spirits to say, well, I, you know, I don't know if I, you know, I'm really in. No, no, God's spoken to your heart. You know that God's spoken to your heart or you wouldn't be here. And he's calling us to really be committed. And to be committed not only as individuals, but to be committed as a community. And from that, he's going to do amazing things. He's going to, he's going to, it's all it takes is two in agreement with him. And it's going to, it's going to, it's going to shift this nation. I am telling you, I, I know that. I, he's, and it's for such a time as this, when our nation is in, on the brink of disaster. And, and when, you know, we have these things going on in, in Belgium. And we know, and we've had stuff going on in the U.S. from ISIS. It's all over the place. The, the, the world is increasingly heading towards chaos. And I'm not prophesying that. I'm telling you that as, as this is, we see it happening. We see these things happening. But as that's happening, God is raising up a standard, and he's bringing us, I believe, into the foundations of a great awakening here in this nation. And, w and the watch is absolutely central to having, to getting that going. If we take our place on the wall and we are, are understand that he loves to do amazing things with a small remnant of people, it's going to wake up the church, and then when the church is awake, it's going to shift the nation. And it's, it's not going to just shift the nation, but the, the U.S. was called to be a nation that goes and, and, and brings his word to the ends of the earth and, and, uh, and that's, that was the calling on our nation. And, and the why is this political season so important? I was kind of, you know, half kidding about Texas and Cruz and everything last night. But what's, what's the distinctives of our nation? It's this. Um, God is sovereign over man, and man is sovereign over government. What that means is, as Christians, we need to be hearing from God, obeying him, and being involved in government. Because we're the ones who are sovereign over government. We're the ones who are supposed to tell government what to do. Government is to serve man. We're not to serve government. That's, that's absolutely unique in the United States. There's no other nation like that. And, and God set it up that way so that we could be this nation that is a light in the world. And that's not, that's not arrogance. That's not, this, this is, this is, these are the foundations on which, we were, on which our nation was built. And we're in a crisis right now in our nation because our nation has lost, has lost its way. And as a nation, we don't really understand that. We don't understand that. But part of the watch is we're to, we're to pull all this together, you see, and, and God is going to start shifting things. And do we, do we all get that? Do we all, do we all understand that? So this is like, 
I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be heavy-handed, but I don't think I'm being heavy-handed. This is so important, and we need to understand that we got a sign, as Peter was saying, before the meeting ever started. He, he doesn't want us to miss any of this. So let's just, let's, just, let's just raise our hands towards heaven. Father, we just want to receive what it is that you're saying to us today. Lord, we don't want to miss anything. You've called us for such a time as this. This is an Esther time. And Lord, we, even in our weakness, God, your power is made perfect in our weakness. So, so we, we just take our weakness and we lift it up to you and we just say, Lord, Lord, make perfect your power in our lives, in our spirits. We want to be one with you and we want to understand in a deeper level how being involved in a community of believers, a community of the watch, a community of prayer people is so vitally important that it's essential. It's essential that we be involved uh, uh, because we can't do what you've called us to do without, without that. We can't be involved. We can't do what you've called us to do without being in a community, a community that flows as one, a community that hears from heaven corporately, as you showed us, demonstrated last night, and, and, and goes forward. So today, again, we just lift this whole day up to you. We just say, Lord, have your way. Speak to us. Help us to really get it. And we just come against the enemy that would disqualify, that would minimize, that would say, no, it's not about you, if, 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 or it's, it's, it's that you're not really, you're kind of standing on the side. You're on the outside. And the Lord says, no, you're a vital part. You're a vital part of my plan. You're a vital part of my plan. You're a vital part of my plan. And you say, well, all I have is sticks and, a, and, a, and you know, something to make noise with, like the Gideon's army. Well, you know what? It was Gideon's army that defeated the enemy. And they were, outnum they were outnumbered so badly, it was absolutely ridiculous. But God, that was God's plan. He, sh he, he reduced the size of the army by 99%, down to 1%, so that there were only 300 going against 120,000, and they had great victory. To the world's eyes, it looks ridiculous, and that's what the enemy's trying to say. This is ridiculous. But God. All right. Wow. Uh, yeah, C come up here and help me with this, Sue. Say what I said again. The odds are ridiculous. But God. Two of you are gathered in my name. Let's just go to that Matthew verse, Matthew 18. Let's just read it. Because this is the word of God. This is not, you know, somebody's good idea. Yeah. I think it's Matthew 18. Um, yeah, Matthew 18. Starting in verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. There's something that is very profound about this. When you were speaking, I went back to Genesis 14, and where Abraham, uh, Lot was taken away by the um, about five different nations that came against Israel and Sodom. And um, Abraham heard that Lot had been taken. Now, there were, I believe, nine, ten nations that were fighting in this valley of Sidim, which was full of tar pits. Ten different nations, and Abraham took 300 men, 318 men, go down to retrieve his nephew. And you know when he did it? He did it at night. Is that amazing? I mean, can you imagine 
if I saw the Syrians and the Iraqis and everybody and the God said, go and get them, I would think, are you kidding me? <laughs> but that's the kind of resolve that we need to have, faith in an overcoming God. Because when we align with him, the host of heaven is with us. And that's the point where we're at. God is calling out a remnant army. And I look in this room, and there is solid gold and silver in heaven. You've been refined in the, in, in the refining fires. And God is calling us forward to meet with him. He's got a plan and a strategy that's from heaven that we need to apprehend and bring down. And we will see the, our, a holy God move on our behalf. And that's where my faith is. I'm not w talking in presumption. My faith is God. If we align with you, God, show us your plan. And then that's what we need. Uh, we, our uh, job is to obey. Hear and obey. He'll do the rest. Um, so, Paul, you have something that... Come on up. Quick. And there's, there's a couple of prophetic things that are going to come forth, but I think we need to hear this and then we'll... But come on in. In the flags, I saw uh, one was green and one was purple and white. And what I hear a thread in this is God is working on us first thing this morning to get us aligned with where we need to be to go where he wants to go. And uh, in, the, in the green, it was a grace. There's grace for every, anything that we need to unload. There's grace. And then in the purple and white, it was a redemption unto royalty. And for us to get that royalty mindset to move forward. And that's who we really are, Re royalty operating under the Holy Spirit, you know, with the re redemption of the Holy Spirit, then we can battle so much better when we understand who we are. Yeah, okay, so, so, so what, what does royalty mean? It means that we're, uh, we're slaves to Christ, yes, but we're also friends of God and uh, we're also sons of God. We're also, his, we're also his children, which means that everything that he has is ours. That's covenant. We have, he's poured out, he's given us everything of his that that's, it's one and the same, it's ours. The other side of that is that everything that we have is his. And, and that's where, that's where, that's where, roi that's where royalty is. That's, that's, that's what you're talking about. Everything that we have is his. It's not like we're doing something for God. It's like, no, no, it's, no, we're, co we're in covenant with him. So vitally important. Our, that means our lives are really are not our own. Right, right. From 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 heaven, which means we know our identity and we know our authority, and and out of that comes our calling. We've got to, we've got to absolutely get that. We absolutely have to get that right. We're not orphans. We're not orphans. We're not orphans, and we're and we're not we're not begging for the crumbs. We're seated at the banqueting table, and all the resources of heaven that we that we need, everything that we need to accomplish the task, we've been given already. We have to. That's why he's trying to tell us this this morning. We have to appropriate. Yeah, it's it's not even it's not optional. He's given us everything. We can't say, oh, God, come and do this. No, there's something that he's called us to do. He's not going to do for us what, we're, what we've been called to do. We have to step into the water, and he's, and he's going to, he, he will resource us with everything that we need, absolutely everything. No matter, it doesn't matter how ridiculous it looks. So, so when you hear something, in, a little voice inside of you saying that's ridiculous, understand this, that's not God. That's not God. Or ridiculous and condemnation or ridiculous and disqualification or ridiculous and, you know, it's not you, it's for somebody else here. It can't possibly be you. Not God. That's ridiculous. It, it is God. That's what he's saying. Yeah, that's yeah, the exactly, the exactly. The other, the, the other side of it is this is so ridiculous, I can't possibly do it myself. Yeah. That's when God steps in. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 amen. 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 Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Ron had something.
which is that's I mean that's part of the that's the new covenant. What, I mean what you're talking about. Just go ahead and stand up. Yes. 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 And wh whatever you want, even up to half the kingdom. You know, amazing. Do you want to uh, uh, know another sign that is a wonder? Just before we left to come here, we got an invitation to the White House in Washington, D.C., I mean, it's to a prayer gathering, but it's just supernatural that the doors of the king opened to Melchizedek, so Esther. to Esther. <laughs> um, we really need. To okay, okay. So, we with yeah, Jim, you want to you want to come on up? I'm gonna sit down to bother asking why, but thank you, Lord. Um, how many of you believe? Uh, how many of you believe that God is an inclusive God? Okay. Here's what I heard. And if it doesn't come out real pretty, that's okay, because I believe it's from him. He said, my children, I love you. Thank you, Lord. I know of those secret things. Lord, help me tell you that you're not able to communicate with others. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. I saw when I was sitting up here, you know how the spirit wells up? And I could go up and down and say, I'll wrap up in one of two other. Third time, I said, okay, i got to say something. The Lord gives me an opportunity to now. What I saw was a fish, and I saw a stream. And I saw a river, and then I saw an ocean. I said, wow. And he tr was trying to share with me what I heard was some, some of us feel that we're missing it somehow. We're getting too old, or we're not part of it, or whatever. And I says, okay, what's that, Lord? And he put it together for me. Basically, king of fish, ictus, Jesus Christ, God's son, Savior. We will be like Christ in his likeness. We are like Christ when we're saved. Okay, who are the fish, right? Usually spawned in a quiet place. Starts out in creeks or rivers or whatever. But the river gets stronger and stronger and it flows, right? Sometimes these rivers go down into the ocean. The ocean makes gigantic waves and they're powerful, right? Okay, this is what I got. I was says, Lord, how does that fit? People not feeling part of things. He says, some people don't realize that they are a part of it. Does a fish know it's wet? Okay, do we know that we're right in the middle of exactly what Brett and Sue are saying is happening now? And I'm for one, I've been a Christian a long time looking at all that stuff and going, no, it's happening now, and you are a part of it. And for those of you that are feeling left out, he said, it's in Psalm 138, 8, I will accomplish that which concerns you. Trust me. He said, trust me. I will complete this good work. That's a great word, That's a great word, Jim. That's a great word. That's a great word. <clears throat> okay, go. Come on up with your prayer shawl. I think this is, a, we need to hear this before we go into what Paul has to say here. I'm really new at this thing. <laughs> um, um, December, right before uh, we had a meeting in Redmond, Oregon, for a similar thing. Um, one day, I was just in the house. I felt this strong, strong unction to gather materials and make a shawl. This shawl was something I had never attempted before and I could not even begin to understand how I would do this 
but I knew that by the end of that day, I had to have it ready. It was so urgent. And at the end of the day, I thought, what is going on here? And the Lord said, this is a wedding shawl. And the next morning was the global call, and God put the pieces together. He said, I want to knit together prayer warriors from around the globe to prepare them for my wedding feast. You are, this is a prayer shawl. And then we went to Redmond, <laughs> and the pieces came together even more. God gave me confirmation. And one of the confirmations was some vision that some one of the other couple of the other people had about God putting pieces together and holding together with a golden thread, um, which is the picture of unity. And so God just all through this time He said, "This is something beyond your ability." And I started, and the first color was from South Africa. What happened in South Africa? Lausanne. First prayer, first unity of prayer. And God just had just had me praying the whole time. It took me two months to make it. Uh, I ripped it out eight times. So God is saying, this is not easy. There is warfare involved here. This is hard work. It's beyond your ability. But it is going to be a beautiful prayer garment for my glory. Wow, thank you. Amen. Okay, Paul, do you want to come on up and share? Um, last week, Paul and I were praying in the morning, not, not at six in the morning, but, <laughs> um, and anyways, Paul had a vision and it was an amazing vision. And we live way up on a mountaintop or the highest peak in our County. And we have a prayer, um, prayer room up there. But anyways, what he saw was that our prayers went into like, um, I guess like the, the water is the best way to describe it. So our prayers are like a, a little pebble that goes into the water and you see all these ripples. And he saw in the spirit that our prayers were covering the county, the state, the nation, and they were going forward. And this morning as we were meeting with Fred and Sue, God said, it's not just your house. It's everybody's prayers. And as Fred was saying, two or more, and it was just Paul and I, that two or more people can cause an amazing ripple effect throughout the world. And so you might be praying for one particular thing that I'm not praying for, but that causes a ripple effect. And what you're praying causes a ripple effect. And, and so all of ours <laughs> makes that beautiful prayer shawl that she just made. That's, that's how powerful we are. And I used to be one of those intercessors that Jim was talking about. Oh, who, you know, nobody notices me. Nobody cares about what I do. And I just was in my closet by myself or whatever. And God has just pulled me out like he's pulling you out and saying, no, what you say and what you do counts. It is so very important. That's all. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, it's so nice to be here. So nice to be here. Uh, you know, Fred comes off as a real serious kind of guy. Uh, I was still working full time, and he and Sue were taking Angie all around the world, and uh, I really couldn't get away. And it's like, oh my gosh, they're stealing my wife. I better get on board with this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he comes across as so super serious and pious. And then I spent New Year's Eve with Fred, and uh, it's a whole different Fred when he puts on that, that, that conical hat and he's got a little blower and, and he's blowing that on New Year's Eve. So anyway, he, I want you to imagine Fred with that little conical hat on and one of those little <laughs> <laughs> happy New Year. So uh, anyway, here we go. So thank you, Fred, for letting me speak. Yeah, you know, 
God, I think, has given all of us a strategy. And uh, I wanted to go back and talk about some historical strategies from all the way from Gideon in the book of Judges to our Revolutionary War and then getting into World War II. Talk about strategies in the physical, but also being undergirded by the spiritual. Because if we don't have God in our camp, on our side, then ultimately we're going to lose that war. So how did they do that in those three areas to come out victorious? And what do we do today to win that ultimate victory that is his? And But we're going to fight the good fight because uh, he is our father and he gives us the strength that we need, just as Fred was talking about and Sue, that we don't have that strength alone. And it's going to be uh, with a partner or partners or with a group, but uh, he is the undergirding to the ultimate victory. So uh, we saw a video uh, recently on, uh, on media that I think talks about the group coming together and scaling the wall and uh, taking the enemy stronghold. I just like to, it's about 15 seconds long, so I want to show you this uh, brief video. Here we go. Can we get lights back there somewhere? Don't worry about it. Thank you, Lord, for that ultimate strength. Sue, or I was Fred, alluded to uh, Gideon, the book of Judges in uh, chapter 7. And when Gideon started out to defeat the Midianites, he started out with 32,000 strong warriors. And God kept telling him to winnow it down, winnow it down, winnow it down. And he ended up with 300 uh, to win that ultimate victory against 120,000. They talk about warriors from the east. So if you look to the east of uh, Israel today, you're going to see Jordan, and you're going to see Syria, and you're going to see Iraq, and you're going to see Iran. And that area really is a hotbed of ISIS and a lot of the terror that is infecting and infesting the world today. And if you go to uh, Judges chapter 7, and this is key, this is a historical key to what we need to do. He says, watch me, Gideon said, follow my lead when I get to the edge of the camp. And this is uh, verse 17. Do exactly as I do, and when all who are with me, blow our trumpets from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. And uh, for Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle. So they reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And the Hebrews, what they did back then, they, divide, they divided the evening into three watches. And they took that middle watch for that attack to win that ultimate victory over the uh, Midianites and the uh, Amalekites. And then jumping forward, coming to our revolution, really starting out in 1775. And, you know... If you look at Gideon, he defeated the strongest army that seemed insurmountable to beat back in those days. But jumping forward now to 1775, the strongest army in the world is the British Army. And we are subservient to them. And we decide that we want our freedom. And the battle cry was uh, no taxation without representation. And we're being very much oppressed by King George III and the British Parliament, and they were taking away our rights and our liberties. And the first major watchman that came out of that era was Paul Revere. And about 40 years after the death of his ride, a very famous poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, wrote a poem that really um, raised Paul Revere to a whole new level as our earliest watchman. And he wrote a poem called Paul Revere's Ride. And it went something like this. It said, listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive 
who remembers that famous day and year. And he said to his friend, if the British come by land or by sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch, and one oath by land and two oath by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and to spread the alarm to every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. And so there's our first watchman. And if you look at what transpired from that revolution against the British Empire where we finally became a nation, the Bill of Rights. And it said we have the rights in that Bill of Rights to life and to liberty and to the pursuit of happiness. And these rights are inalienable. In other words, they don't come from the king. They don't come from the president. They don't come from the Republican or the Democratic Party. Those inalienable rights come from God because he is the one that gives us our rights. And then jumping forward from that, the last one, because Fred said, you better not go more than about 10 minutes, or I'm going to twist your arm. So I'm on about six minutes, Fred. I'm, get, I'm getting there. Okay. The biggest conflagration in the world was World War II. And Sue spoke about her dad in the Pacific fighting at Bougainville against the Japanese. I just recently lost my dad six months ago at the age of 95. And he fought in the European and the North African and the, the Burma theater against the Germans and the Japanese. And that war, in order to defeat the strongest army of the 1930s and 1940s, which was Hitler's army and Tojo's army, we had to have a strategy. So what I did, I, Angie and I prayed, and I, I jotted down, I think it was six things, just really quickly. The first thing is, in order to win the war, you have to have an objective. You know, what is our objective, or in other words, what is our mission statement in order to win? Who are the key players? Who are the major players? The third thing was, what kind of strategy are we going to have? The fourth thing was, what are the resources that we can galvanize and pull together? So resources, evaluation, how are we doing in our fight? And then the last thing is the ultimate victory. Just let me uh, give you a couple of specifics for World War II, and then I'll uh, conclude. In World War II, the objective was defeat the axis of evil which in those days was Italy, Germany, and Japan. I think George W. Bush used that term just recently when he was president, and he called the axis of evil Iran and North Korea. And who was the third one, do you remember? Yeah, Iraq, Soviet Union, whatever it was. But he used that same terminology. The major players back then, the three major powers, the USA, Russia, and Great Britain. They, they were the major players in that war. The strategy was to develop a plan best using the forces unified to attack the enemy stronghold. The resources were to use the overwhelming industrial might of the U.S. to supply the weaponry to defeat that axis of evil. So once again, the United States was the key player. Evaluation, regular summit meetings to analyze the progress and adjust the goals as things moved along. And the three key players back then were the world leaders. You have Franklin Delano Roosevelt from the United States, Winston Churchill from Great Britain, and you had Joseph Stalin from Russia. And they would have frequent summit conferences to say, okay, where do we adjust and where is our next attack going to win that ultimate victory? And then the victory was the unconditional surrender of the Axis and to occupy by the Allies to ensure freedoms in the lands that they had taken back and reestablish the liberty of those peoples. And so just to conclude today, we need to use a similar spiritual strategy. And we have one for Ojai. The one for Ojai might not be the, Fre uh, the Fremont strategy. It might not be the Ireland. Where's where our friend from Ireland? Where did she go? Could you stand and introduce yourself just quickly? Because you weren't here yesterday. We have a, a global visitor from Ireland just showed up this morning. <laughs> go ahead. Would you introduce yourself, please?
And your name? Okay, we'll, we'll get it later, okay? <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. But welcome, welcome, welcome. So nice of you to be here. Thank you very much. So my, my concluding point is you develop the strategy for your region. We have one for Ojai. We're from a small town of 8,000 people down there. And Angie and I, we're on our sixth decade of marriage. She was my child bride, so we've been married a long time. So I finally came alongside her and Sue and Fred because they kept taking her to Israel. I thought, I have to get involved in this because uh, uh, they're getting all the glory and they're doing all the uh, movement and I'm just sitting home uh, watching the NFL and this isn't going to work. So uh, anyway, here I am. It's, it's, it's great to be here. But your strategy uh, for your region is not going to be the same as ours for Ojai. And our mission statement for Ojai was to take the 12 major cities in Ventura County and take them back one by one by one. We started with Santa Paula. We feel we took it. We, we next went to Ojai last year. We feel we, we won that for the Lord. And we met with three major leaders from Oxnard last week at our place. We have a... Uh, a uh, ministry called Eagle's Nest. We're the highest place in Ohio, 2,000 feet up. It's the highest area. We pray frequently for, uh, for Ventura County, and we met with three leaders from Oxnard, and we have a strategy to go in there. To finish that strategy in World War II, D-Day was the big attack on the continent by the British and the Americans and the Poles and the French and the Canadians were involved in D-Day. They all went ashore. But before we did D-Day on June 6, 1944, we did an attack at Dieppe using 12, and Dieppe is a small coastal village on the town of France. We sent 12,000 men in there to just to test the German defenses, and those men were slaughtered. And uh, we, Churchill and, and Roosevelt realized they would be, but we had to sustain those casualties and that loss. So when we went in on two years later, and took the Germans out and pushed them back into Berlin with a half a million men, we knew the strategy to win that war and get the ultimate victory. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, the, uh, Paul tried to take a picture of me in my party hat at New Year's, and I, I wouldn't let him. <laughs> Because I knew it'd be, all, I knew it, I knew it'd be all over Facebook and the internet the next day, so be careful of uh, when you get your picture taken. Uh, the the and I think I think the, the one of the key points that you're trying to emphasize was that the strategy that you got came out of the watch. It came out of the watch. It was a strategy from heaven, and it was very is very it's very key in taking down some strongholds in your area. So so part of this is. You know, two or three getting together, hearing from heaven, and then developing a, developing a strategy. That all comes out of the watch. Yep. So we're going to finally get to the place where we're going to be able to raise that, get us into some discussions and go into the war room and put some context behind the vision that we're talking about. But we wanted to get some basic foundational um, values into our hearts before we talk about any kind of strategy. Vision is really important, the foundations of vision. So I wanted to just take a brief moment to kind of give you a context of uh, why we're doing what we're doing and uh, what we are sensing the call of God. Um, you know about the open vision that I had in um, October of 2000. And over the years as we've pondered it and talked about it and God has brought us back to the place of you know, a vision for a global watch. Um, it, we've really tested it before the Lord. And I can say, looking back over the 14 years, we've underestimated the power of it and also the resistance of it. God has had us in the trenches of World War III, in the <laughs> as we all have. And but now we're in a different season, and he said, I've had to have you in the trenches. I've had to have you dig deep in order to show you the things that are on my heart. We don't have all the answers. Everybody in this room has part of that answer. But we're in a time and a season where there has been a, a wisdom of heaven released into everybody's heart that when we can come together, there's going to be strong agreement. And um, 
so anyway, 9-11 really uh, was a, a critical point in our lives. Uh, I won't go into it, but shortly thereafter, I was on my first trip to Israel. And it was in Israel that the Lord showed me Amos 9-11. And he said that was my message. And if you look at Amos 9-11 and if you look at the Psalm 132, there's a parallel of a call to America and Amos 9-11. Amos 9-11 is, on that day, I will ra raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Go read Psalm 132. There I will make a dwelling place in America. Why has IHOP, Kansas City, been raised up here? Why did 9-11 happen on our soil? I believe it has to do with the prophetic fulfillment of a scripture that God has said. And we're in the times uh, all over the world now since 9-11. There has been tremendous prayer efforts begin to crop up everywhere. You can't even enumerate it. It's hard. It would be hard to even tabulate. Yeah, I don't, God doesn't want that. But he wha do what he does want is to wake us up to what he is doing. And that's why we are here today. And as God has given us the grant, granted us favor to review the walls in our own city, as li like I said, we got off the big conference thing. God had us go into the trenches to evaluate what's going on. And we've been reviewing the walls much like Nehemiah did, really since 2006. So it's a good long season, a decade of looking at this and going overseas. And with uh, God's granted us the opportunity to review the walls overseas as well. Prayers cropping up all over it with good-hearted, strong, determined, called people. But as we've reviewed them, we've seen a weariness and an exhaustion. Oh, come to my house of prayer. We've got 24-7 going, you know. I go into the house of prayer, and I'm the one there with the worship leader. Or I'm there with the screen. And I'm looking at the devastations in the world, and I'm saying, where is your people, God? So the reality is that there's a tremendous amount of resistance in the Western world, resistance, complacency, apathy, if not outright um, deception that keeps us from going entering into the true place. And there are those that are being called in the true place that have just been battling and been exhausted. If it's not the Western world, it's outright religious opposition in the Eastern sector, generally speaking. So what do we do about that? And the Lord pulled us back last year, July 17th in Bakersfield, and we released the trumpet call. The trumpet had sounded. We've been hearing about the trumpet everywhere. What is that message? Gather together, establish the watch. And the first place the watch can really make an impact is on the fourth watch between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., what's known as that. That's the general time. The, you know, the third watch or the, the night watch in, in the Old Testament times, the fourth watch in the New Testament. So I'm generally talking about the night season when I say the fourth watch. And so as I've started talking about it, I'm realizing, you know what? God is waking people up during those hours. We just really need to know why we're waking up. I mean, I talk with our, the mentoring group that I had with the, the women. Two of them, hey, you guys, hi. <laughs> there they are, um, and 12 women. That, uh, we were together for about three months, and I asked them, hey, are you waking up anywhere between 3 and 6 a.m.? How many? All of you guys. The youth are waking up. You know, God is waking us up. It's like, it's like, well, let's wake up then and answer to him and not worry about our sleep. It's like going to the spiritual workout gym. If you respond to him, you know, all of a sudden you go, and you do it. And, you know, we did that in our group. One of the gals went to a, a, a teen town in Bakersfield and was working with a gal who was really troubled because she was waking up every morning between 3 and 6. She, g she told the, the gal about it, and the next night she had an encounter with Jesus. We're on the beginning of an awakening. That's why we're doing emphasizing the fourth watch because it's a powerful, powerful time to encounter God. Israel was delivered across the uh, from e Egypt on the night watch. Gideon defeats the Midianites on the night watch. Abraham goes in and retrieves Lot on the night watch. New Testament, 
Jesus and Peter walk on the water. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. It's countless. How many powerful encounters are on the night watch? Luke 12, the thief comes in when? At night. So why not be up and apprehend him? What if we got a night watch on the pro-life issues? It would take a remnant. I think we would see a little bit more advance. Hey, we're fighting this constantly, constantly in our heads. And then, you know, it with good intent. But how about being strategic? Let's be the Navy SEALs of the prayer movement and get into that point where the enemy is really taking the advance. So that's why we're uh, starting the, uh, the night watch on this and we're emphasizing it. Is that th the only thing? No. My, my, I believe that what God is going to do is fulfill Malachi 1.11. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. And it shall be constant. There shall be uh, praise, an, a, a total incense arising around the world, um, every place. Every place. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God is restoring the tabernacle of David. So that's what began in, uh, ba back in July. We decided with a small remnant of people we'll do the fourth watch. And guess what? Within two hours of that meeting, the Lord of hosts showed up, not just in Bakersfield, along the entire West Coast with a massive outpouring of rain. It was record-breaking rain. Out of nowhere, God thundered. He came down from Mount Sinai, and I was shaking in my knees. We, uh, we have pictures of us. Uh, rain in a in a drought stricken area. It was the worst drought. We haven't had seen rain like that for over seven years. In the middle of summer, Mojave Desert rain. You got to be kidding. I hope we take it seriously. I hope we take this cloud seriously. Pointing us, we better be under the fear of the Lord. That God said, "This is my plan for America." And you know what? I've had about five minutes to speak this vision over the phone. A few times, maybe 15 minutes max. Tonight, today, was the first time in America, yes, last night, first time in America I've been able to unpack a little bit of the vision. And that was just covering the sur surface. And yet you have responded. The Western Wall is up and it's running, and it is working. And it's beginning to work into the other time zones. I honor you guys for being here, for hearing the sound of the trumpet. We need to pray for those who are sent going, being sent into the other time zones. And I am believing that we're going to have time zone after time zone up and running. And I'm not believing for much. 70 per time zone, 10 people per day. We've already started past the torch calls from east to west from 5 to 6 a.m., ending our, our fourth watch on Sundays and Thursdays. I'm believing that we will have those every day of the week. Can you imagine the turning of this nation? Can we believe in that as an initial vision? And guess what? As more unpack it, as more unpack it, we go to the spiritual work up gym, something happens in our hearts. You know, we're ignited more for prayer. I'm believing that houses of prayer are going to come up and our prayer rooms are going to be filled. Because the people will discern the times and the seasons that we're in. We've been to the spiritual workout gym, and we've got that muscle, and we've got that vision. This is not, not about come to my ministry, come to my event. This is an invite from heaven. And who will take up the charge? And who will work together like those, that team? Navy SEALs, it's all about team. You know what Michael says? We're reprimanded if we do things on our own. Those guys get trained so that they will fight for each and die for each and other. And I, 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 we are in a major spiritual battle, guys. Let's get out of our slumber and our sleep. We're in the same place that Israel was when Sennacherib came after him. And Sennacherib came after Israel. Go back to your vineyards. Go back to your easy life. Hezekiah, you've done a wonderful job of reforming Israel. and You've gotten kind of back into the good place, and you're prospering, and you've gotten really good bat and lazy. And my vineyard's so good, and my garden's so good. Ah, I'm just, you know, life is good. Go back. Do it. And Hezekiah and Isaiah hear this, uh, this taunt. And Sennacherib is just about to overtake the country. You know what? 
Hezekiah and Isaiah took hold of the horns of the altar. They stripped themselves and covered themselves in sackcloth and took hold of the horns of the altar. We will not go this way. And God sent in an army and wiped out Sennacherib and saved Israel. Two. Two. Saved the nation. I get a little passionate about that. So the principles of what we're doing, the night watch, we're working together as a family. I am so thankful when I look across this room, there's relationships in, that are in place that weren't in place a year ago. We're working as a family and the, uh, ending the calls at, at 5 to 6 a.m. And I'm believing that as people grow into this thing, that that sense of family, that sense of community is going to grow from time zone to time zone to time zone across the nation. Even in our city now, Otilia is here wanting to start a Hispanic watch. And I'm, there are several others that are beginning to come on to the fourth watch, and I'm believing for the youth to come on to the fourth watch. And we're going to gather as a family and begin to grow even within our community, but we're going to stay linked to the time zone watch. So you can... it's. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. You can take your banner and begin to work the night watch. You can begin to work your watch in a, in a community in your college campus. You can do it uh, in, uh, for a, a presidential candidate. You can do it for uh, your work situation. We can do it for pro-life. We can do it for the Native Americans. Come on. But the backbone is the fourth watch and staying connected on that watch and then let's see things grow. I'm believing that we're, we're in Bakersfield, I'm believing we're just at the crest. We're just at the crest for God to naturally birth out that 24-7. It's going to take some more, but it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. We're losing the, f the fact there's a big religious spirit pushing 24-7 right now, and it's exhausting people. It's got to be his presence. And the desire in our hearts to be drawn to that sink line. That's what this fourth watch is doing. It's breaking through the spiritual barrier so that we get our perspective right. Is that clear? So today we've got the basics of the time zones becoming engaged. And what we want to do is now develop deeper strategy to begin to develop the, the strength within us and to, to move us out to cast the vision even further. Okay? You ready to take on the responsibility? Okay. Um, let's see. We've got a number of groups, and we're going to take a break here. And you're going to say, thank God she's going to shut up. <laughs> uh, but we really, I mean, this is critical. The, most of the day now we're going to go into discussions. You're not to hold back. And you're, you're thinking, well, I've not been this way before. I, I don't know what to say. We've not been this way before either. You know what my day is like? Every day, God, who do you want to send me to? Who do I say and what do I say? I am so trusting in him. We are pioneering. There are a lot of watches out there, but you know what? The relational infrastructure is very key to this one. Because that, to me, is life-giving. So um, in, uh, there's a number of people that have graciously uh, arisen to help us with these groups. Maybe if you can come on up here as I call you out. Communication, Peter Carlson is going to be talking about how we can develop the communication infrastructure and the things that we're already doing with the updates. We need that firmed up. Um, we need, an, uh, we need uh, communication. We need uh, a focus on Israel so that we can be watchmen for Israel. What kind of updates are going to be helpful for people on the wall? So the, the point is that um, there's how many different groups are there? There's five? Yeah, there, yeah I, I will. Just, I just want people to understand. There's five groups, and you guys are going are gonna to pick one of the groups, and, we're gonna, and then we're going to go into the group. So you need to be listening to what the different groups are. Okay. So Paul uh, Royal is going to – Paul, come on up. You're going to be refining the vision, the mission statement, and what goes along with that. Uh, Stan Matus and uh, Laura Mallory, come on up. Our East Coast and Central Zone representatives are going to be talking, uh, it, re reviewing leadership within the watch and building the community to multiply out. Denise, 
Stafford is uh, really involved with Harvest Evangelism, a big collaborative group. You're going to be investigating how we can collaborate with larger stream ministries and communicate with them. Um, and uh, resourcing that with prayer and discipleship materials. Ready? <laughs> and uh, for those who are interested, Otilia and Sam are precious pastors from uh, Bakersfield who have started the Hispanic Watch. This, this is really a big pioneering effort. So um, before we break, um, can we all just stand up? And um, actually, can you spread out, guys? Okay, 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 right, okay. Spread out, because so I'm going to have people come up around you. Who we're going to pray for you guys in just a minute. So if you know which group you are uh, involved in, you signed up with, I want you to go up by your leaders. And we're going to pray. If you don't know, begin to figure it out and pray right now. Uh, for those who are, would like to be involved with communication, over with Peter, administration, here is Stan and uh, Laura, vision, Paul, collaboration here with Ginny, and for dis uh, uh, developing uh, discipleship here with Fred, Hispanic community, or those who are interested in uh, developing some really uh, culture-specific groups over with Otilia.